Welcome everyone. Uh, this presentation is going to focus on uh, various methods of data querying, data management, uh, data manipulation and visualization within Geolog. Uh, most of the topics presented uh, in this presentation are going to be results of common how-to queries submitted by our Geolog support teams uh, or support users uh, like you uh, that resulted in either a novel solution or, or makes use of new or maybe lesser known functionalities within Geolog. So just a quick agenda here, uh, what we're going to cover. I've split the presentation into three different sections. So if you have questions at the end, it, it might help if you, uh, you know, reference the section number so that I can uh, quickly go back to a, uh, a workspace that will help me uh, illustrate my answer for you. Um, <clears throat> so first of all, we're going to deal with a little bit of data management, uh, well data searches and, uh, and queries within Geolog, so both in the project application and the well application. Uh, we're going to cover some common questions that I've had from customers, such as surf searching for wells with data over specific intervals, so not just searching for data in our wells, but actually through specific intervals. Um, well list creation, uh, wells with and without specific data types, and then we'll have a look at a few tips for, for data export that might, that might help you do things a little bit quicker. Um, we'll also look at uh, inserting sets into multiple wells at the same time and uh, creation of composite sets, so gathering data from many different sets and putting them into a new, a new set. Um, we'll look at a bit of core image visualization. This is something that uh, I get questions on fairly often as well. And uh, we'll have a look at uh, the synchronization between the, the depth views and geolog there. Um, then in section two, we'll look at data manipulation. So in particular, we're going to be looking at some examples of uh, converting depth interpolation in sets and logs. And then we'll have a look at uh, how we can use the highlighting tool uh, to help us with our well data queries and creations of uh, subsets of, of data. <clears throat> Section three, we'll look at data manipulation again, but with a focus more on alpha logs. Um, and uh, in this case, we're going to be uh, using some uh, user-defined functions uh, that we're going to be applying either through uh, cross-plot views, log land views, or, uh, or in our evaluate module. Finally, we'll look at the inserting of constants into multiple wells because that's something that I get questions on quite often as well. So we're going to be looking at um, multi-well set inserts and multi-well constant in inserts, uh, but just in different sections. So now I'll switch over. This whole presentation is going to be a live demo within Geolog. And we'll start off in the project application. So on the left-hand side here, you can see that I've got a, a, a workspace already uh, opened up here uh, with the well catalog in the left-hand pane, and I've got the screen uh, split or, uh, vertically. So the first thing I'd like to cover is, like I said, uh, searching for wells with data over a specific interval. So to do this, you know, we can do well queries, right? So uh, we can use the search functionality, uh, open up the search pane within well catalog. And in this example, I'm going to search for some core data, in particular, a porosity log from core. Okay, and if I do that search, I see that four out of my total 53 wells have core. That's great. Now, which core, uh, which wells have core over this bottom uh, shalier interval below our main interval of interest? Well, for that, we can use our map sheet in conjunction with our well catalog. There's a live linking that happens between these two views that can really help us search for data. Um, so if I go and I select these wells and highlight them, you can see that there are the four wells that actually have core. So I have one in each quadrant, basically. Now, what about wells with core over this bottom interval only? So <clears throat> for that, we can use the map sheet and the Z post functionality. And I can search for that log, that phi T from, from core and choose any statistical uh, selection here that I want, min, max, mean, whatever, whatever it is, it really doesn't matter. But now I can see that I get the max value for all of those wells uh, for that phi t measurement. If I select in my interval menu here, in my ranges menu and in my interval log, I can Z post again and see that I only have two wells that return a uh, post value for that particular interval. So, this is a this is a good way to to really you know visualize which wells uh, or how many wells out of your total are going to have that uh, data. 
if I send these wells over to the well application and open them up in a correlation panel, this is a bit easier to visualize. So you can see there are those four wells with my uh, custom color scheme here in a correlation panel. And we can see that there's that P5 well and that P2 well that actually, yes, have data over that interval, whereas the P4 and P6 well do not, right? So it's just a, a, a kind of a confirmation that our post results are correct. And at this point, of course, you could go into the wells tab of your well catalog, select the wells and create your well list that way. So. I'm only using uh, 50 wells in this case and four wells with core, but you can imagine that there are probably going to be a lot more in your projects, of course. So that, that would be the way that we do this in the well catalog. There's also another way to do this in the, uh, in the well application that I'll show you in section two. Uh, the next thing I'd like to cover is uh, making well lists. So just very briefly, this is something that we've probably all done if we've worked in Geolog before, but I'll just clear these values here. And I'll do a quick search for uh, logs in my wireline set. And maybe I'll just use one log as an example, uh, the PE log. So I can see that 11 out of my total 53 wells have that log. And if I make a selection there and highlight them, I can see which wells on the map sheet have those logs. So that can give us an idea of you know, what kind of an analysis we might be able to do here um, on over what areas. Now, if I want to make this, uh, this well list, obviously this is easy. I've already got them selected. I just make my, my basic well list for you know, PEF wells, for example. If I want to make a well list without this particular log, which, which I, I've been asked before, um, the, the, the first step is actually the same. You do a search for wells with. Then we go back to the well list pane. And one little thing that you may not be aware of, if you just click anywhere in this window and drag over, that selects all your wells. You don't actually have to hit Control A. Um, and we can see there are those wells that I've highlighted. Those are the wells with PE. So from here on, it's a combination of our highlighting functionalities within Well Catalog, our selection functionalities, and our show functionalities. So what I'll do first is I'll show only highlighted. Then I'll do a select all, then a show all, and an invert selection. Then if I, if I select uh, to show only the selected logs, you can see now I've got a list of those 42 wells that don't actually have that log. So that would be the way to kind of reverse the selection and make a new list of you know, wells without PEF, for example. OK. So that is about all that I wanted to look at in the well catalog. Uh, if I go back to the search panel just very quickly though, uh, I wanted to bring your attention to the fact, in case you weren't aware, that you can actually save your queries here as a, as a spec file that you can then restore. So for example, I had this query uh, where, where another user wanted me to uh, quickly output some data. And uh, if I ever need to do this, this, uh, this search again, then I can just bring up this spec file. Here's the, uh, here's the search that I did. I wanted to look for logs within the wireline set and within the well header set so that I could get some constants in there too. If I do a search for those wells, I see that there's only six of them. And if I do a select all on there, I can send those exact results directly over to the data exporter, right? So this kind of negates the need to have a, you know, apply a saved query perhaps, or to sift through your wells and do all your sorting and selection to get the, uh, to get the exact data that you wanted. So you can see here in my constants tab, I've got all those X and Y and latitude and longitude that I wanted to come through. Um, and then there are the logs that I selected. So if I want to export these guys, of course, if you've ever exported data from Geolog, you can use the, the default variable text naming convention. This is going to um, export uh, all of the wells in a, uh, in a separate file. So if I just pick a, a custom location for that, I can export those guys. Look at my exports folder, and there's that one file worth of data that's got that the, uh, the location data that I wanted to come through in the well information block, as well as all of the logs that I asked for. Now, if I wanted to, I could output all of these wells into a 
into the same file. So kind of as a concatenated file, I'll just call this file all wells and do the same export there. And you can see that now we essentially have a concatenated file that contains all the wells worth of data, okay? Now, that another place that we can do concatenation is within our file catalog. So we've always had the ability to grab multiple files and bulk load them within Geolog using the import files icon here, uh, and then do a bulk import that way. Uh, one thing that I've found that, that can help though is to concatenate your input files first. Grab that new LAS file, for example, bring it over to the interface and it will open up in the, um, in the file import window. And in this case, it gives you the uh, ability to change the set name prior to import. So you can define that and do a fill down just like you would in Microsoft Excel. And now you've actually defined the set that all of these um, wells are, are going, to, going to go into or all this data is going to go into. So just keep in mind uh, that if you haven't used it before, this is, this is a newer functionality in Geolog. We have the ability to concatenate files, <clears throat> uh, which can certainly help speed things up. Okay, so now over to the well application. And I've got a few workspaces prepared here for you as well. Um, the first thing I was going to have a look at here is um, uh, how to use our new query tool to perform that same workflow of finding wells with data over certain intervals uh, as we did at the, the uh, project application in the well catalog. So this is my workspace that has all of the uh, views that I'm going to need for this particular uh, part of the presentation. Uh, again, I have the same correlation panel up here that's showing these two wells with core over that bottom shalier interval. And I have a very simple query that I built here. And this one is strictly just for visualization. I want to have a look and see how many of my wells have core over that particular interval. And you can see I've got my intervals chosen here in my ranges menu. And I do have these two wells with a value, uh, average uh, phi t core, in that purple zone. So I've actually colored this query view to match the colors that I have in my color scheme, in my layouts, and in my correlation panels, just for, for easier reference. Uh, but the way I created this query, it's actually very, very simple. I want the well, I want my intervals, and I want my uh, an average of that phi t core over that tops uh, interval, <clears throat> okay? Then I've used a character map function. So that's one of our many user functions within Geolog. And I've applied that to the tops log just to get those colors to come through. And if I look in my functions menu here, there it is. So it's just a very simple character map that changes one alpha value to another alpha value. In this case, the top name and my colors that I've used in my interval scheme. Now, um, again, this one's just for visualization, but if I take that exact same query and I add a clause for the sampling log to be that, that uh, porosity from core, now I've got a subset of this data that contains the core point values for each of those zones or for each of those wells within that zone. And using this very handy um, utility that we get with the query tool, I can then create a subset of that data and insert it into all my wells. So this is one of the ways that we can create new sets within multiple wells at the same time. So if I go to my core uh, set here, this new core set that I just created in the P2 well, you can see now that I've got each one of those core points in a special subset that only contains uh, data over this lower shale zone, okay? So that's one way to, uh, to do that query uh, without having to go into the well catalog and use the map sheet uh, in that method. The next thing I wanted to cover is how to insert multiple or sets into multiple wells at the same time. So this is a question I get quite often. Um, you know, how do I, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to, I guess, uh, you know, create new logs in, in different sets that already exist in a well, but what about inserting multiple sets? Um, 
For that, we can actually use the query tool as well. And this is an even simpler query. So a customer asked me the other day, he said, um, uh, you know, I want to gather together a bunch of different logs from different sets and I wanna make a composite set. So a brand new set in the wells, uh, so that I, it's a basically a gathering place of inputs that I'm going to use in the next stage of my analysis. So what I've done here is just grab the, uh, the well name, uh, the depth, gamma ray, neutron porosity, bulk density, and deep reading resistivity from my wireline set, and then the effective porosity, saturation, and volume of shale from my deterministic analysis set. And they're all listed right here. And again, I've color-coded the, the intervals just to, just to make sure that I'm getting all of them in each one of my wells visually before I go ahead and re-import all of this data into my wells that I have selected in my wells menu up here and we can see now if we go down to the con continuous periodic area of our text view here's that new set in each one of our wells that contains all of those logs that we wanted to gather together so this is a, a really good way of inserting sets into multiple wells at the same time along with gathering well uh, logs from from multiple sets so hopefully that'll be useful for you the second part of this section, I wanted to focus a bit on core visualization because this is something I get asked quite often. Uh, over here on the left-hand pane, I've got uh, the results of a deterministic analysis along with some of my wireline logs here. And I've also got some core that I've used our core photo importer to load up. And uh, you know, customers often ask, usually when they're when newer geolog users, uh, how do I actually visualize that core? You know in full resolution view as I'm looking at my analysis here. I wanna be able to reference the core image to maybe some of my core points or maybe to this siltier zone down here on my analysis. And for that, I usually say, you know, use the whole workspace as your visualization tool, not just one view, right? So what I've done here is I've split the screen again um, vertically and I've created a very simple layout that contains only an image track that points to the core photo and I've made it at a one-to-one -one scale. And then if you use the synchronized position option within Geolog, you can see that you can use that condensed scale to drive the core image, right? And then over there on the right-hand side, there's my full one-to-one, -one res you know, full resolution core image. And by default, um, the synchronization is going to show you what's in the middle of the screen on your layout. So you can see it kind of snaps back to that position. But you can also use these little handles at the, uh, on the ends to drive, right? So if I do go down to that siltier interval, for example, you can see the core is starting to light up uh, a little bit. And maybe if I want to drive straight to one of those core points, I can do that. And I can see where that core plug was taken. So it's just a really handy way to, 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 to view both of these data types at the exact same time. And you don't have to let this tie up your entire well application. You can actually just take this, undock it, make the same view, and move it over to another monitor while you completely retask your, your well application here to do you know, whatever you want. Uh, in, my, in my case, I'm just going to be computing a volume of shale here now, and I always have this view if I want it. Uh, on another monitor perhaps that I can I can refer back to that. Okay. So another thing I just wanted to quickly cover uh, because it's a very, very uh, handy utility within the text view, um, but I find somewhat underutilized, maybe for various reasons, I'm not 100% sure, but um, it's the ability to embed files within the well file in Geolog. Now, that core photo I was showing you, if I go back into a text view here, when we load core data using our core photo importer, we get a, a set called photo data, right? And this contains all the cropping information and all the depth registration information for our core images that we stitched together. Uh, but what it also contains is embedded files of the original core photo. So if I double click on any of these guys, the core photos come along for the ride. And that way, if you need to go back to a core photo import session, you can restore that session immediately and all that cropping information and the core photos are gonna be there. So we've taken that functionality and we put it into the text view. 
and there's going to be this icon up here called insert file. And when you press that, you can choose which set you want to uh, embed a file into. And it's, uh, I guess, good to keep in mind that this isn't actually a link to a file in your, uh, in your project. This is actually fully embedding the file into the, uh, into the well app or the, uh, the well file. Okay, so you choose the set, then you go and choose the file and you embed that file. So to give you an example of what that does, uh, if I go down here to my wireline set and I look in the comments tab within text view, you can see here that I've got maybe my uh, original PDF wireline logs, my field logs with the tool diagrams and such. Uh, I've also got a layout that I like to use uh, to view all of the different data types in this project. So you can see here I've got uh, a multi-min analysis, an electrophasis analysis, and a phase summary that I've run here. So these are all model-based uh, analysis or, or, or uh, computations. So what I've done here, if I go down to my multi-min set, I've included the multi-min model that I used for my, my final analysis there, along with the launcher that it used to uh, do the computation. Uh, in my electrophasis set, I've included my Fossimage model that I used to generate the MRGC uh, electrophasis results, for example. Uh, pay summary, same thing. Here's the pay model that I used, my cutoffs, my flags, my lumping criteria. So this can be really handy when you're maybe handing data off to another person or maybe uh, you know, you, you know, handing it off to another company that you may have sold the land to or anything like that. It just, um, you know, it might help you avoid having to zip up the entire project uh, in order to archive it or, or move it somewhere else. So handy, really handy. Uh, uh, utility within the text view, and this works for pretty much any any uh, file type. So, okay, moving on to section two. So, what what I'd like to show here is some examples of how we can uh, do some depth interpolation conversions. So, we're changing the interpolation, the depth interpolation of a set and or of a log. Um, <clears throat> the one I'd like to start with is going from a continuous interpolation, as we're seeing here in this lithology track. I've got a continuously interpolated uh, faces log here from some software that we've imported into Geolog to display alongside of our other data. If I switch this to maybe a 1 to 10, you can see that constant 6 inch or 0.1524 depth step there. And what I want to do is I want to block this data. I want to I want to turn this continuous interpolation into a tops interpolation, uh, so that I can maybe feed it into uh, you know uh, other modules that might work better with the tops interpolation, or maybe to get different query results where I want to look at maybe thicknesses or cumulative thicknesses and things like that. So there are a few different ways to do this in Geolog. Uh, we have a uh, a blocking. Um, module that we can use to apply different algorithms to our data. Uh, there are some interpolation modules that run uh, certain interpolation conversions, but um, the best, the easiest, and the most consistent way that I've found to do this is just to write myself a little um, program here in, uh, in Logland. And the reason I wanted to show this is that um, it is a fairly easy uh, one to write, uh, particularly if you've taken the introductory log land course. Um, it, it doesn't require a lot of coding expertise to put something like this together. But essentially what this does is it takes a continuous numerical or alpha facies input. So this could be a lithology log or a, a broader facies log, or maybe the results of an electrophasis analysis through, uh, through Bossimage. And what it does is it applies a log constant called interpolation to the output depth. So I've got an input depth and I've got an output depth. And then what it does is it uses a not statement to check if the lithology or the electrophasis log has changed in the current frame since the last. If it has changed, it outputs it to a log. If nothing has changed, it skips. And then it goes until it changes and then outputs that new tops interpolated section. So here's what it looks like. Uh, here's that not statement I was telling you about. Here's the reset statement that goes and starts uh, calculating again when it finds a new value. And here's that interpolation depth out. So we're applying this attribute to the depth so that the output set is going to be a tops interpolation instead of a continuous. 
And if any of you uh, find this useful and would and would like me to send this to you, uh, just you know include your uh, include that in your in your feedback for this presentation, and I'd be happy to uh, to fire this off to you. So running this module, I'll just do a quick restore on parameters here for the sake of time. Uh, I'm going to be using this Deneb well. I've got an inter uh, uh, an input set of continuous lithology and an output set uh, that I'm going to be uh, using tops for. So I'll hit start on that, and we can do our comparison right away. I've got this layout set up that way, so you can see the interpolation of continuous over here, and the uh, the log and the lithology track looks exactly the same, except you can see that it's now a tops interpolation. Okay, so one of the uses for that that I've found is uh, to put into our query view, so you can see what I've done here is I've computed the thicknesses of each one of these different facies occurrences in each well. Okay, for that, I use the sample thickness uh, expression within the query view. So I've got our facies here, our depth here. I've used a, uh, a special uh, character map user function to convert the lithology codes to colors just so they're more easily referenced uh, within the query view. And then I've used a qualify function or a color bar uh, to apply to the sample thickness column, just so we can get a bit of a heat map there, right? So for visualization, this is great, but if you actually wanted to output these thicknesses, um, this type of statistical information, you can certainly do that using the, uh, the import database query result function within the query view. And that'll output as a tops interpolated log for you. Over here, this query is uh, the exact same query, except I've used the sum of the sample thickness just to kind of get a cumulative thickness of each one of these facies types within each well that I've got chosen over here, okay? So just an example of, of something that might, uh, you know, work better or get you the results that you need using a TOPS interpolated log rather than a, a continuous interpolated log. Okay. So next I'd like to have a quick look at, at highlighting and how that can help us uh, get some better results for, uh, for you know, further analysis or to maybe feed into query views as well. Um, <clears throat> let me just open up this layout over here. I'll go to my Atlas well and uh, switch scale so I can show you what I'm highlighting here. Um, I'm going to use the highlight menu which is typically up at the upper right-hand corner of the screen, but I've just moved it down here to make myself a little more real estate while I'm showing this to you. Uh, I'm going to highlight this zone here, this cleaner zone here, and maybe this shalier interval here, okay? So when you make a highlight on any view within Geolog, it's going to create a temporary highlight set for you so that you can view those intervals that you've just picked with the highlight menu, right? Um, if you want to save those picks that you've just made using the highlight um, function, you can then go and simply give this temporary set another name and save it alongside with your well. So that will actually uh, now save alongside your well and no longer be a temporary set. Okay, so here's a few views over here on the right-hand pane that make use of that. So here I've got my different highlight colors. And what I've done is I've brought the neutron porosity and bulk density along for the ride. And one of the purposes for that is because I kind of want to make a subset of this data that I want to then view maybe in a, uh, in a, in a cross plot, for example, right? <clears throat> now, If I then take this, uh, this uh, query view here, I can then output this as a continuous interpolated log because I want to view the neutron density or uh, neutron and density here uh, only within these highlighted zones. I can output that, and now we have a cross plot only with that data. Okay, so I've been asked several times in the past, you know, I've, I, maybe the customer has. Uh, put in a filter expression, for example, 
I've got one here that I just had prepared for you guys. Um, right, let's just say that's our filter expression. And now I want to export only this data. So I've been asked that several times, how do we do that? Well, it was a little bit difficult before, but with the query view, it's actually fairly, fairly simple. And, and if you wanted, you can actually take that same filter expression and apply it within your query view as a where clause, right? So if I just add an and symbol in here, you can see that we have now a truncated result within our query view. And if I re-import that into the well, you can see that we end up with that exact same um, uh, distribution. So what we've done there is we've made a subset, a complete subset of our data that we can do whatever we like with further analysis, export it to another software or so on. So um, definitely one of the one of the really handy uh, features of the uh, of the query view is the ability to subset data like that. Okay. <clears throat> Another way that we can use highlighting uh, to generate uh, different types of uh, statistical results is uh, is to use polygons. So another type of user function that we're going to be dealing with here are polygons. So I've got a bunch already made up. I'll just insert them into this cross plot, and there they are. So I've just I've tried to split up my different lithology zones here within the cross plot, and then we can use the highlight polygons feature to go back to this well and see that the depth track is now highlighted and we can compare that straight across with our faces log here, which is going to be a little uh, bit broader in terms of its divisions, but this is more the lithology log over here. In general, we can see that it's following along pretty well. What I've done here is I've created another query so same thing, I want the neutron porosity and bulk density to come along for the ride, but I'm using the wireline depth as a sampling log, and I just want to see what those neutron and, uh, and density values are over these different lithology types, right? <clears throat> In this case, what I've done is I've just generated a thickness of each one of these lithology types. And then if I wanted to, I could maybe then grab the neutron density uh, and put them over there and get the average values over those different lithology types as well. So um, lots of different ways to, to use these query views. Uh, highlighting can certainly help you um, subset the data even more, um, but uh, just, just a few different methods there for you of, of making subsets of your data, okay? <clears throat> So some other methods of, um, of uh, converting, I guess, depth interpolation in your sets. Um, there's one of the more common ones, uh, changing, say, a TOPS interpolated log into a uh, continuously interpolated log. That just involves the insert of a new set, right? So I'll just call this TOPS continuous. You would then choose the continuous periodic uh, type and interpolation, set your desired sample rate, hit OK. That brand new set is going to be put into your well. You can then go to your top set, grab whatever logs you like, say depth and our new tops log here, and uh, copy and paste them in. And then you end up with your continuous log. So this is, this is one that's been around for a long time, but you can see how that's been uh, split up and you have the same alpha value. This works for, for, um, for numerical values as well, where you don't get interpolation in between the depth frames. A question I had not too long ago though, uh, that required a bit of a interesting um, workaround was, how do, I, how do I take data like a dip data, for example, or core data, that's point data, how do I convert that to a continuous interpolation so that I get basically a blocked log where there's no value interpolation in between the different uh, dip values or core point values. Well, this one starts out the same as doing a, say a tops to a continuous. So you insert a new set, choose your depth set. I'll just call this one dip continuous because I'm going to be changing my point dip data to continuous periodic. But what we need to do here 
is temporarily change the set to a TOPS interpolation. Then we copy all the logs into that new set and paste. And what you should see there is now we have a constant value from one dip point to the point where we get to the next dip azimuth and, uh, and uh, inclination. So if I go over to this well here, there's an example of how that works. So there's our different dips. And you can see now we have a consistent uh, blocked dip value from one point to the next. So presumably this was to compare with some other view, maybe in another software or, 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 or something else. But uh, regardless, just so you're aware, it is possible to do this, uh, to go from point or from continuous aperiodic to continuous periodic. Now what we'd want to do at this point is go and change our dip log back to a point interpolation and then save our well. All right. So I'm going to move on to uh, section three now. And section three of this presentation has to do uh, again with data manipulation, but more with a focus on alpha logs. Uh, because this, these are questions that I get quite often. You know, it's 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 easy to um, to go into the say the well catalog and change the names of uh, alpha or, um, or or numerical sets. You know, in multiple wells at the same time, uh, change the name of logs in multiple wells at the same time. But what if you need to go into an alpha log and change the value of an alpha log in multiple wells? That's not so easy. Um, <clears throat> So that's one thing I'd like to cover here. Um, first of all, though, here's a very common question I get. How do I color my plots to match the interval scheme that I'm using in my layouts and in my correlation panels? So I want to basically be able to split my plots, my cross plots, or my frequency views, and each interval, I want them to have the same colors uh, to correspond with the, uh, the different colors in my, in my correlation panel. So to do that, it really helps to know uh, a bit about schemes you know, within Geolog. And to create a scheme, you simply need to be in a layout, right-click, scheme create, or you can use the dedicated uh, scheme creation tool. All right? Now, those get stored in the well project well. So if I go over to my text view here, I can see that I have three schemes. This is the scheme that I'm using uh, currently. If I go into the constants tab, you're gonna see a constant either called log levels or log surfaces. So if it's an interval scheme like the one I'm using, it'll have a constant called log levels. If I go over to my logs tab, you should see that you have a depth, a color, and an interval. And essentially what's happening here is we're applying colors to each one of these interval thicknesses, and those are going to correspond to your, to your interval names. So, if I do this, I go in, uh, I can create a brand new function. So that's what I want to do. I want to create a color bar uh, that I can use uh, for custom colors here. So I can copy and paste these colors into a color bar that I've created using the color map menu down here. So I'll hit File, New. I'll use the Tools button to determine the size, so I'll go 0 to 19 because I know I have 18 intervals in this field. So I've chosen the well with all of the intervals to make to make this scheme, just so it's not going to be missing anything in other wells. And I want 18 divisions. So now I've got a blank color bar with 18 divisions. If you want, you can interpolate between the endpoint colors there. But regardless, you want to save this before you can use it. So I'll just call this one Scheme. Then I'll go to my files menu. I'll go and find that function in my functions directory. And I'll simply paste those scheme colors in there. Now, if I go back to my, uh, my cross plot, I can use the color tab to color by interval number and add that new color bar. And now we have a plot that's colored 
the same as those, those interval schemes. So it, we basically make use of, of the qualify function to do this. So if I do a split now, based on my intervals that I've got chosen in my ranges menu, you can see that those colors have now come through for each one of the intervals. And I guess another little tip uh, for, uh, you know, if you're using this default gradational um, um, rainbow color scheme that uh, Geolog gives you, you know, it's pleasing to the eye, but sometimes uh, there's, there's thinner formations that don't come through so well. So what I did quite a long time ago is I created just a, like a 25 color um, list of colors here that I can then use to go and paste into my, um, into my schemes, for example, okay? Now, if I go back, I can then see that those scheme colors have changed and those thinner beds are coming through quite a bit better, right? So that's definitely something you can do. There's nothing saying that the scheme colors are fixed um, or anything like that. Um, but you know those scheme colors can all come through in, in all of your uh, different graphical views within Geolog so that if you want to split based on interval and then color per interval, go right ahead. Okay, so that's just a little uh, tip on, uh, on schemes and visualization. And one last thing I'd like to cover before we, uh, before we stop here is uh, the insertion of uh, multiple uh, constants. So this is going to be basically making wells searchable based on a new constant that you've inserted into, into those wells, uh, perhaps because uh, you know, that data didn't come through uh, during import or it wasn't available. Um, and this log land here that I, that I built, uh, again, this is just an easy, consistent way for me to do this particular um, uh, task. But uh, what it does is it inserts a wireline logging vendor constant into the wells that I have chosen up here in the ranges or up here in the wells menu. <clears throat> So again, a very simple log line, it doesn't even use any input logs. What it does is it applies a vendor name attribute based on what I have selected for this vendor constant, okay? It's a very simple code. Uh, and I have some, some common wireline vendors up here in Canada. If I set the vendor to say Weatherford, for example, that, that uh, I guess that, um, that attribute is going to be called Weatherford. So if I go and launch this, <clears throat> and I know either by maybe vintage or geographic area or log mnemonics, I've built a, a well list of, of, uh, of, of wells that were logged by different vendors. I can then maybe choose those guys, select the vendor for that particular set of wells, then go to that well. And in the well header set, if I go to the constants tab, you can now see that this well is now going to be searchable or uh, you can use it as a split criteria in your plots, uh, for example, based on that constant, okay? So maybe these two wells here, I'll set a different one. There's that new constant there. So this really helps when you wanna do data comparisons between different logging vendors. So I've got a plot set up here that I can then use. And I've got a special uh, character map here that changes the vendor name that comes out of this module to a specific color. So that not only can we now split plots based on, on that constant, but we can color them too. So if I go to the split tab, I can simply type in that constant name. And now our plot is split based on that criteria. And if I go to color, I can apply that the same way I would say in a uh, evaluate statement in this expression window here. So now we've got a nice split plot, colored Schlumberger blue, Weatherford red. And if we want, we can then maybe use the ghosting feature to compare entire wells worth of data, or maybe just specific you know, zones worth of data to see if there might be any data issues or differences uh, from for whatever reason. But regardless, it's a nice QC tool um, that's uh, that's easily usable within Geolog. 
Okay, so that's about the last thing that I had to show. Um, one quick thing though, I noticed that one of my colleagues uh, did in her uh, presentation on Geolog not too long ago, but it covers uh, custom menus. So I just wanted to show you briefly uh, how you can generate a custom menu, custom workflow menu inside of Geolog because I was helping a customer with, a, with this the other day uh, who was uh, uh, getting some of her colleagues to work on the same data that she was working on. So she wanted them to know the workflow. And it was just really handy to have this uh, custom menu as part of the workspace. So to create a custom menu, you go up to the file menu, new, and all the way at the bottom is custom menu. And this custom menu then gets inserted into a folder called app defaults. And I initially created this uh, particular menu as part of uh, a workshop that I did on, on logland and scripting uh, with some of my colleagues. So I added in a bunch of different functionalities here uh, so that I didn't maybe have to go to a new tab and continually go back here and you know, open my launchers and find my log lands. I can now do all that strictly from this new custom menu. And what this other customer was asking me is like, okay, well, can we put some instructions in there? Well, yeah, for sure. I've got a uh, an instruction uh, text file in my data menu. So here's the instructions for the workflow. I've also went and I grabbed a bunch of documentation from our from our uh, from our help directory uh, within Geolog, right? And that's simply a a path to that particular file within the Geolog installation, opened by a file activating command, right? So you can always have uh, any documentation that you need, uh, internal to Geolog or external to Geolog, right at your fingertips if you need it. Likewise, with any views that you might want to use. So this is a really handy customization feature within Geolog that I just wanted to bring your attention to in case you haven't used one before. Okay, so that will pretty much conclude the, the live demo portion of this. Um, for any of you that, that showed up late uh, and didn't get to see the agenda, uh, what, we, what we covered in summary uh, are some, uh, some methods for uh, searching for wells uh, with data over specific intervals. Uh, well list creation. Uh, then we showed how to uh, search for wells with data over specific intervals in the well application as well. Um, how to insert sets into multiple wells at the same time, get it on core visualization, uh, depth interpolation conversion examples, so tops to continuous, point to continuous, uh, continuous to tops, things like that, um, and use of highlighting tool for, uh, for querying creation of data subsets. So definitely the query tool is very handy for, for making subsets of data for further analysis or perhaps for, for export into other softwares. And then finally, I uh, had a look at a few visualization options um, and then uh, the application of some user-defined functions to, to, uh, to manipulate data and to create brand new data, and then the uh, insert of constants into multiple wells at the same time. Well, thank you, everybody.